tell me how many times I said no. Come to me with a really good idea on when we need to invest. It's pretty hard to say no to, right? And and so I think that permission to be in other people's lanes or just go explore, to me, that's the good stuff. You mentioned Nugget, that's where the fun is. What our alumni love about the school is the outdoors. We have 340 acres, we're on a lake. Like, why would we hide that? Why would we only put pictures of kids in classrooms when our kids canoe and windsurf and, and sail every day after school. In the winter, they go skiing and snowboarding right on our campus. And so we just had to com become comfortable that this is actually who we always were and this is who we were going to become. Welcome to the Net Assets Podcast, a partnership between NBOA and Tybal Education Consulting and your hosts, NBOA President and CEO Jeff Shields and Tybal Education President Howard Tybal. This episode marks the first in what we hope will become a collection of some of the best and most illuminating interviews dedicated to you, independent school business leaders. As NBOA grows into its new brand identity, we have the great privilege of launching this podcast with a conversation about an institution unafraid of telling the story of what makes them great, a school unburdened by the weight of telling the stories they think the public wants to hear. And who better to share that story than the extraordinary leaders of the Lakefield College School themselves? Lakefield College School is a coeducational boarding and day school for students in grades 9 through 12 in Lakefield, Ontario, Canada. And today, Jeff and Howard are joined by Anne Marie Key, head of school since 2017, and Tim Rutherford, Associate Head of the School, Operations, and Chief Financial Officer, who has served since 2014. If you've ever wondered what it takes to be authentic in your mission, to elevate faculty, staff, and students, and transform enrollment growth along the way, you need to check out this conversation. This show is made possible thanks to the generous support of community brands. K-12 schools need a technology partner that can elevate the family experience, drive operational efficiencies, and connect school communities. Community Brands is that partner and is proud to serve over 5,000 private and independent schools nationwide. Community Brands K-12 experts will help you find the perfect solution to evolve with your school and provide best-in-class support throughout your journey. Visit communitybrands.com slash schools to learn more about how their purpose-built solutions fuel school success. And now, over to Jeff and Howard. Thank you, Pete. Howard, I always wanted to say that as a guest on your podcast, and now here we are. We're here. It's We're doing our it. our podcast. We are... Are recording the first episode of the Net Assets podcast, co-hosted with Jeff Shields and Howard Teibel. It's like a dream come true, honestly, my friend. We end the annual meeting and you go, we got to do a podcast. We do. And then life takes over. Well, we say we have to continue the conversation. Right. And now we get to continue the conversation and in the best way, because I've been in independent schools and started in higher ed. You're with independent schools, working with independent schools, and and know a lot about higher ed. And now we get to tell their stories. All these people we've met, we get to tell their stories so that we can inspire others, I hope. Yeah, we um, hope. Tell them. I do hope. I do, too. And and that we can share um, accomplishments and innovation. And, and I'm just really excited. And thank you for agreeing to go on this journey with me. Thank you for involving me in this. This is great. And we have two amazing guests I'm today. I'm so excited. They were at the top of my list. And then they said yes, and here they are. Anne-Marie and Tim. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We're really Why happy are you to be giggling? Here. This top is so exciting for us. You were the top, top of, of our list. list. Come on. Yes, you're the comeback kids. <laughs> so we are thrilled to be exploring these successes you've been having at the Lakefield College School. And there's so many things that Jeff and I want to get into and explore with you. Partnership resistance to change, connection, but most importantly, how you engage your entire community mm. 
to produce the successes that you've had right now. And Jeff, I know that we are all inspired by what we just listened to. We, we have a lot to dive into, but I think it's worth acknowledging for people who are listening to the podcast that we're recording it at the 2024 MBOA annual meeting in Atlanta. And we are literally minutes from the opening general session with Sean Canungo, who is the author of The Bold Ones. And I wanna start with a quote, because I think we're all kind of hyped up from his conversation with us. Um, and he said something that I think, I hope, resonated with every educator that was in the room when he said, you're in the business of soul. Mm. What did that mean to you, Anne-Marie? Mm. When I heard that, I thought uh, automatically about our staff. Yes. And they work so hard, as all boarding school staff do, and they, they want the best for their kids. They want, And so it's really tough when, when I first started at the school because we weren't successful, and yet they were doing everything right. And so we thought a lot as a leadership team is how do we make them feel good and feel success? And so the first thing we did to your point around, we got, how does everybody get involved? We sent everybody out um, in small teams. They had to be cross-functional. So the business office with a teacher, it couldn't be the same department. And every single person was allowed to go somewhere for a day and ask about what the school should be thinking about that's different and what the school should be thinking about that was the same. And that created energy. That's exciting. I love that. Tim, same question. The business of soul, what does that mean to you as, as someone who's in the CFO seat? Well, I, I put it in the context of your question, the CFO. So as a business officer, being part of the business, which is working with kids and working with students and, and the soul. So as an example, my wife's an educator. I'm an accountant. Our conversations at the end of the day with our own kids are much different. And I was like, that's the good stuff. So soul really resonates with me, right? Not product driven. So for NBOA and its membership that are largely the support to be able to be attached to something that is really it's soul based. It's it's motivating. It's, it's it. where you want to work. It's where you want to have your passion. It really gets at the core totally. because it's not just education. It's character. Yeah. It's it's who they are, who they'll become. <laughs> so let's go back for one moment. Who found who? Did you find Tim or Tim? Did you find Anne Marie? I already made um, a change coming out of corporate. So I'm, as of today, 10 years in this business of soul uh, hey, for where we work. 10 years. Yeah. And um, so we were kind of put together. Uh, so um, that's how we came about to, to our working relationships. Yeah. I remember, though, when you, in one of our first meetings, you basically said, like, we're going to work together and I've got your back. Mm. Oh, I get a little emotional, <laughs> but it was, we really started from that point of we're doing this together and it hasn't always been easy. We've <laughs> disagreed a lot. We joke about a term called healthy tension, um, but we figure it out and have fun. Absolutely. You got to have fun and, uh, and, and laughter is the other side of the healthy tension. And we always agree that we're getting to the better place. So a uh, funny little anecdote. Amory, when her first day arriving to campus, and we had met before and, and we knew each other, but um, and the business officer would appreciate. So she drove herself in a U-Haul that said 1995 a day, and I'm like, okay, I really like this. I really like this, <laughs> right? Yeah, she's thrifty. So yes, okay. We're, I think this is a good picture. start. I'm like, I think what? this is a good start. <laughs> he needed right? a receipt. Uh, he needed he a receipt. He sent it to some of our donors. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, you're gonna like her. Yeah. Um, but but healthy tension is something. I mean, we've had. Um, um, many, uh, you know, I'll say disagreements, but we, we agree to disagree and move forward if it's for the better good. But Tim, you saying that to her on day one, you've really encapsulated the advice that I think every CFO, that's exactly what every CFO should say to a new head of school, because that's, that's not only what they need to hear, I think that's your role. I think that's absolutely your role. And that's, I think probably that was the first seed of this great partnership. Well, tell the story about the day you told your faculty and staff, you're all gonna make phone calls 
to students and parents. Well, tell us that story. It's a brilliant story. Mm. Well, I stole it from somebody else, as all good heads do. <laughs> Take Excellent. the best ideas. And so we put a picture of every single student up on the screen and asked staff to volunteer to make the phone call. And we tried to have them not call somebody who they were their direct teacher or advisor. So there was a bit of a surprise element. And I have to say, it didn't go over all that well as we were explaining it, because uh, one thing I hadn't anticipated was that they wanted a script, like they wanted to know what to say. And so we had to say, well, just take a photo of them. And, uh, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time finding the professional photos. Like we wanted this to be authentic. We wanted this to be like a spontaneous and, and just create some energy. And maybe Tim, you can say then after the nervousness. Tim was not a fan of this strategy <laughs> initially. Is that fair to say? Well, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I, I, I was nervous on how it would be embraced. So I think it's that connection between what do you do with data and and then how do you do it or how does it fit how does it fit your van? How does it fit your soul? And for us, it, you know, in hindsight, it was really simple. I said, you know, wild leap of faith, but it wasn't because relationships to me are fundamental to that business of soul. But it was the data of saying, you're gonna make 10 calls. And I think people were really nervous with that because we're telling them what to do. And I think for, and, and I, I was one, I'm an advisor, so I made calls, but I, I kind of didn't like being told that I had to make them, right? But understanding really, it's the same thing. It's it's de demonstrating those relationships. So, you know, you you can be very deliberate with the data, um, embrace yourself, and then just learn and work work off that, enhance yourself. And that that was a change for us in that uh, that particular program. And what, what happened is our teachers, who are you know so relational, made these calls, and what they weren't expecting was the parents to be super grateful, super excited, and then there started a new relationship and and gave the teachers great feedback. Feedback. And so they were so surprised. Every parent I saw over the next few months was a little bit awkward for me because they would all lean in and say, you'll never believe who I got a phone call from. And I was torn as to well or are not to tell them this was a strategy. Um, but it just created all this positive energy. And it was, it turned out to be one of the, I think, smartest things that we've done. And we've kept doing it. We are, our head of admissions, Dave Darby, uh, he does something called a knownness survey. Um, I think all schools should do that. And it just makes us more aware, to da Tim's point about data, of who is known in our community and what are we doing to make sure that all of our kids are really well known. I think we're so focused on how do we get to an outcome versus saying, let's experiment with something. And then my guess is it was a, it had to be in some ways a surprise at the rate that you saw this turnaround in enrollment. Ugh. Because the, 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 the amount of time that elapsed to produce this uh, was extraordinarily short. So say a little bit about the connection between the motivation for doing this and how that tied to the outcomes you were looking to produce. Our head of enrollment would say that getting a turnaround in enrollment is about a thousand little things, not one. And so this was a big part of it that what we wanted was every one of our faculty and staff to feel the tension of what it, low enrollment feels like, and it doesn't feel great. And so, you know, I, Tim would share the numbers. This is what this means. Um, and, and, and we were pretty transparent around our financial model. So we all understood, and we all also, I remember one of our admissions team members saying, it's cheaper to retain a student than to find a new student. And so bringing all of us into that sort of sense of common language and common sense of urgency and helping them realize that part of their job is knowing and loving these kids, but it's also, we're also a business. And teachers, we none of us like to think about these places that we love and we work so hard to make successful as businesses. So I think that was a big part of that that messaging to everybody as well but you had to have been blown away by the results we all know the pressures that boarding schools are under and to your point one student that that leaves is has a huge impact on your business model so your wild leap of faith and 30 percent enrollment growth tim yeah, and I, I think it goes back to being bold, and it's easy to say in reflection back. Um, 
and being uncomfortable. So not only had we just recently experienced an enrollment drop, but the history of the school was to have pretty uh, steady enrollment. So we were below that and we made the decision to grow our capacity, make a large capital uh, investment in our infrastructure so we could grow. So we actually went down before we came up and you know, it would be contrary to what some businesses might do when you're in a decline is to cut infrastructure or capacity and we did the opposite. So it's easy to say after the fact when you're successful, but at that time, that was the healthy tension we talked about earlier. Um, and I'll bring that back to relationship. I think, you know, Anne-Marie said, you know, the importance of me saying, you know, I, I have her back as a new head coming in, but also it's reciprocal because I think it's really important the role of the head or role of leadership or board or whatever is to have the business office or the CFO or whoever the role or the team is involved in the decision making. Not in the corner or not after the fact. They have to be at the forefront. And then people I think are more comfortable with taking risks and being able to then move forward rather than, you know, typical accounting, record the transactions after the fact. You need to be looking out front. I love that. There's so many questions I have around this. I love that you came to a school that you said the faculty and staff should feel better about their work, and I want them to feel better about their work. And one of the unintended outcomes of this retention strategy was that they, they feel better about their work. But I want to pivot to something else, which I also love from your story. And that is this idea that Camp Lakefield was a pejorative. Mm. And now it's a source <laughs> of pride. Tell me, Tell me, what did Camp Lakefield mean then, and what does it mean today? So we were really struggling with, are we an academically rigorous school? And the, the, the reputation was that maybe we weren't. And enough of us had been into enough classes to know that we were a strong academic school. And we did make some changes to the academic. We trained everybody in Harkness. We did extra APs. We did some of those, uh, you know, standard enhancements to your academic program. But we, we just doubled down on, you know, what our alumni love about the school is the outdoors. We have 340 acres. We're on a lake. Like, why would we hide that? Why would we only put pictures of kids in classrooms when our kids canoe and windsurf and, and sail every day after school? In the winter, they go skiing and snowboarding right on our campus. And so we just had to com become comfortable that this is actually who we always were, and this is who we were going to become. And what we also learned through the pandemic, we started a task force and we started a farm. And once we started the farm and we were, we had all these kids producing vegetables and, and gardens, it was, it's amazing. It, it is amazing. We then found in our archives that we used to actually have a farm at the school over a hundred years ago. And so I feel like when you're going back to your roots, ha ha ha, uh. um, we, you know, that's also sometimes the right future direction. Howard, I love, um, um, I know you work with a lot of leaders, and I love when when a, when leaders can take what's a perceived weakness and turn it into a strength and turn it around. Um, I just think that's so exciting. What are your thoughts on well, that? Well, it's, it, it's a matter of, like, leaning in. Authenticity. Because, you know, it's the fear. It's like, can I really tell a different story here yeah. about what our real assets are and value as opposed to everybody around going, if we do this, it's going to diminish the perception of who we are. We won't get the kind of uh, young people who would be, whose parents want to see them go on to uh, college and so on. You offered a different way to engage the community. Was there a challenge in just in terms of getting the board lined up around this or did they get, were they in right away? You know, there's that expression that you never waste a crisis. And so the fact that we were down just helped. And so we just kept giving the board data. Um, let's, you know, how many, exactly how many kids are on financial aid, exactly how many kids are coming from different countries. And then the board was actually pretty helpful um, in challenging us with good questions um, to consider, uh, you know, different ways of looking at things. So, for example, we doubled the number of sending countries. Uh, and so we weren't reliant on one or two international markets. That was a big difference. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of work with the board to bring them along so that they were better equipped to ask good questions. And I think a lot of that started with data. Uh, 
Agree and data and involvement. So Amory talked earlier about the, you know, the we call them day hikes. Go out and explore or do something. Board members came along, so it wasn't, you know, and we had that healthy tension as well. But when you're, when you're involved, so it wasn't an us them and that type of thing. And really, um, you know, we did we learned a lot from them as well. They're experts in industry, and and a lot of other people have um, experiences in let's say downtown cycles or whatever. So we needed to learn from that as well. We have a really unusual governance model. We have a school board and a foundation board. We also have about 100 trustees. And I don't know of any school that would do that. I see you raising your eyebrows. I, I, Everybody I, would, not, I, would, not, I would not recommend <laughs> that to a school. But However, tell us how it works for you, yes. Th we brought them all into the solution. And as long as there's clarity around who does what and whose decision is what, and I felt really comfortable around who I reported to and who did I just seek advice from, and that's a really important distinction, but what we did is we brought our, our foundation trustees out to visit Shawnigan and Brentwood, two amazing boarding schools on the West Coast. And then I think that helped them see that part of the change that we needed was to put some um, resources into our facility. Because we all fall in love with our own schools and think it's just perfect and it's quaint. And, yes. it, and why would you change that? But then you go and see other schools and bring your board members there and then it also just helps them get on the same page and that was a big turning point meeting in fact that's when we approved the the building of the double residence it sounds like that's where you kind of developed a shared vision with them mm. we could be this lakefield college could be this this is what I'm talking about. And I guess you had to really visually present it to them so they could say, yes, we aspire to be that with you as well. That's really exciting. You know, my hope too, from listening to this podcast, that people go back to the articles, there's so many amazing nuggets in this article yes. about some things people can take back. One of the things that's in here, which I thought was great, is Tim, you talked about, we don't just stay in our own lane. And that's a really important idea that we try to, when we work with schools, is this idea of a leadership team, that it's about what's good for the whole, not what's good for enrollment, not what's just good for finance, or, you know, the people overseeing the academics. Talk about how you created that culture, or you are creating that culture, because I'm sure there's healthy tension in that, too. I agree 100%, and I think I think that's where the fun is. So I think that I think the answer, simple answer is just permission to go do that. As the majority of people here at the conference and in, in, uh, members of MBOA are our accountants. We love our comfort zone. We love our spreadsheets. We love that. So just permission to go actually play in other lanes and, and learn that. And then all of a sudden you learn more. So the spreadsheets make more sense to be, you know, very analytical about it. And when you see the front line, you see it in action and you're seeing everything there. And then it's mutual. You're in, you're not just the penny pitcher that says, no, you can't do it. I have an expression at our school, like, tell me how many times I said, no, come to me with a really good idea on when we need to invest it's pretty hard to say no to, right? And and so I think that permission to be in other people's lanes or just go explore, to me, that's the good stuff. You mentioned Nugget, that's where the fun is. I was gonna tease you when you said spreadsheets because we have a pretty large leadership team, we're at 12, and we put the uh, head of HR on the leadership team. And so the, all of the key areas are around the, the table. And then Tim does a great job of helping us understand the spreadsheets. Here's the impact of this decision. If we built an extra residence and grow a little bit, it's actually more about the enhanced programs that we can have and the better student experience that we can have. And so helping everybody understand the business model, but also the impact on students. And I think that took some time with our team and, and some heated debates, uh, because it, 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 in one hand, it's easier to run a smaller school. Everybody knows everybody. It's very family-like. And we were making that shift to becoming a little more like a business without losing that core focus on relationships. I have to tell you, Anne-Marie, and I know you're going to, because you're too, you're too humble, but but you, you are sitting here as one of the most business savvy heads of schools. I've, it's because I've, I've learned met. from you. Well, that's not what I'm looking <laughs> for. But but where has it come from? Was it out of necessity? Was it, have you grown 
in this role in your business acumen out of um, out of necessity? Um, where is this coming? Is it your partnership with Tim? Mm -hmm. I mean, you really, when I talk to you, not just today, but other times, you really talk about the business of boarding school education. And that's, I just think that's so interesting as a head of school mm -hmm. that that's so much a part of your leadership role. Well, I used to run the national organization and uh, case, and what I often heard was heads say to me, like, can you talk to them about we're a business, not just a, a school community and a family? And I also saw a lot of schools that really struggled. And, you know, so they, they had to come to grips with the fact that if you didn't focus on your two main sources of revenue, enrollment and fundraising, you were going to to face some challenges and so I think I think that's where that comes from. I listened to a great strategist once who said there are only three things to strategy. There's your unique value proposition, there's revenue, and there is no number three. <laughs> you know as we think about sort of transitioning to wrapping this up even, I think there's two really interesting perspectives I'd love to hear from both of you because I'm thinking about the audience listening to this, which primarily are business officers, but also heads. So what would you say, Tim, and then we'll turn to you, Emery, that you'd want to offer up to other business officers who are recognizing this is something they like to do and they need to get the buy-in from their head? How do you engage your head to just even open this conversation if you haven't yet? Well, I, I think it goes back to our earlier comment on just the, the ability to play in other lanes. And I think as business officers demonstrate a greater knowledge of, you know, outside of the business, what's the purpose, what's the soul? And when you have that connection, it, I think it makes the transition to those conversations a lot easier. I also think uh, business officers and myself included need to be a bit humble as well to what the head's telling you, right? Because I think business officers are, you know, innately the protector of the funds, the fiscal fiduciary, use all the terms you want. Um, sometimes we need to be challenged. There's been times where Anne Marie said, like, I think we need to do this financial. And Sean talked about it earlier, good leadership, you can't be putting up roadblocks. Or he, he talked about being in, in rooms where a lot of people say, no, we can't. So that brings me back to the ability. I think we have to learn to understand, you know, okay, we might need to explore it when your first uh, reaction might be no. Very nice. I'd ask you, a, but in a slightly different way, which is how would you want to encourage business officers to engage with their heads? Because there's a receptivity and a confidence and sometimes there's a fear. Can I really open something up? If it's, if it's not their idea, because they'll follow your idea, right? You came in with a vision. But in some cases, they have the heads they have and the business officers are saying, how do I engage with this, them in these big ideas? So what, would, what would advice would you give mm. to business officers? So I think the, the relationship between the business officer and the head is, is key and it's based on trust. And so I guess one piece of advice I would think about is we initiated some task forces where we just brought in other voices and created a, a place and it's just five meetings with outside experts. And then that helps to navigate, you know, instead of like who's right, me or you, let's bring in a board member, a staff member, a student and a few outside experts. And, you know, we, we kept tight to this model. Um, and, and whenever we've been trying to figure out a problem, we've, we've launched this task force, a five meeting with outside experts, and it, it's a great way to just have great conversations. Can I throw an add-on? Because one thing you had asked me earlier, I think what Anne-Marie has um, allowed me, and, and it's a lot of fun in what I do, is then permission to be engaged with, I'll use an example, donors. So I think, our, you know, maybe is unique to our school, and I don't think it should be for others, but the relationship I have with a lot of our key donors. So Emory doesn't put up a roadblock to say, oh, all communications need to go through. And, and I think that's maybe a bit unique. It, it's wonderful because I get exposure to these wonderful people. And it's not just business relationships. These are personal. I think the benefit from a business standpoint is for key donors who are given, you know, they're, they're funding our schools, they need to be comfortable with the business side of it as well not only the leadership. So having, you know, I can look them in the eyes or vice versa. Unfortunately, it also means they can pick up the phone and call me as well. But freedom to allow those relationships exist. And I don't know if that happens in every school. 
I don't know if it does either, but I hope it does more thanks to conversations like this. Which Jeff, I, I think you picked the, the, the best first two guests for I, our podcast. I, I know I did. Yeah. And I want to thank them both for sharing their story and for, for being such great leadership models for our community. And I'm so glad we got to share a little bit in how you did it and get to share it with a broader community out there. Yeah. Thanks, Howard. You're we welcome. did it. The Net Assets Podcast is produced in partnership with NBOA and Tybal Education Consulting with direct support from community brands. K-12 schools need a technology partner that can elevate the family experience, drive operational efficiencies, and connect school communities. Community Brands is that partner and is proud to serve over 5,000 private and independent schools nationwide. Community Brands K-12 experts will help you find the perfect solution to evolve with your school and provide best-in-class support throughout your journey. Visit communitybrands.com schools to learn more about how their purpose-built solutions fuel school success. Production and engineering by Pete Wright and True Story FM. Music this week is by Anthony Vega and Zach Nelson. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing that you can do to support the Net Assets podcast is simply to share the show with a colleague. Thank you for listening. Thank you.